Wilson. Well, for the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan that QR code on your screen right now or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. If it feels like living in Britain is like living in a foreign country, that's because it is. You lucky taxpayers are £4.3 billion of the foreign aid budget being spent on refugees and asylum seekers. We are now spending more than 50% of our £9.9 .9 billion bilateral aid budget within the UK. The EU has just passed a pointless new migrant quota deal that will make more people rush to the land of milk, honey and complete gullibility that is Great Britain. There's been a 239% increase in homeless refugees since 2021. Where are they going? Ah, yes, I imagine quite near the top of your local housing waiting list. We're closing migrant hotels in a bid to save money, but it's costing us more money because they'll all end up in social housing or private accommodation bought by you, the taxpayer. And the National Audit Office has said that around £1.2 billion is expected to be spent on housing migrants in large sites like RAF Scampton or Wethersfield. But back to the foreign aid issue now. International rules allow countries to count first-year costs of supporting refugees as overseas development assistance. So, that's what we're doing. But because you're all more intelligent than the government gives you credit for, you'll have already noticed that they're fudging the numbers, aren't they? You're still paying the £4.3 billion out of the foreign aid budget, but because these people aren't going to leave Britain or get a decent job and be able to support themselves for quite some time, at all, you will probably be paying for them forever. And we can't hide that in the foreign aid budget forever, can we? Your massive tax bill is coming across the channel every single day. Is it too much to ask for a British government to put Brits first? This is now the worst of both worlds. We're still spending billions abroad, like giving Somalia £100 million in 2022. We gave £110 million to Nigeria. We once gave a load of money to a Kenyan rainmaker and an Ethiopian girl band. We've given the Taliban hundreds of millions of pounds. Just let me read this sentence to you, a statement from our government. Following the Taliban's capture of Kabul in August 2021, increased UK commitments meant Afghanistan became the UK's largest bilateral aid programme, with spending rising to 286 million in 2021 to 22. We're supposed to be giving them 151 million pounds this year. After a long day of stoning women to death, having questionable relations with young boys and plotting to kill us all, they retire for the evening to sleep soundly on a bed of British taxpayers' cash. But you're paying for them when they come over here as well. But it's about more than the money, isn't it? When you look around, do you feel enriched? I mean, not literally, obviously, because we've already established that billions of pounds of your money is going to refugees and asylum seekers. I mean, culturally, societally. Do you feel more safe? The British public are paying every single which way, and they are fudging the numbers to try to mask the true cost of this. Let's get the thoughts of my panel this evening. I'm very gratefully joined by the wonderful Nana Aquia. I've also got the founder of Global Britain, Aman Bagal, and, of course, the ex-Labour advisor, Matthew Larza. Uh, Nana, I'll, I'll start with you. Mm. I, I mean, this is just an affront. When are we going to start putting Brits first? Well, you know, it's like they don't care about us. I think they're more concerned with how we look to other countries, to other people around the world. So you always hear them bragging about... We're the fifth largest, or maybe that's the sixth now, probably. We're the fifth largest economy in, you know, when everyone... And yet, they're still giving money to China, still giving money to Pakistan. Some mm. of these countries, which certainly don't need our help, we're still handing out money, but it's all about show. It's like, you know, when, you know, you see your neighbours and your neighbours are all trying to make it look like everything's lovely and fine. This is what they're doing, but yet the British people... We, the British people need help more than ever. But yet we are bragging, and I, I feel as though this country is almost turning into a third world country. We can't keep lying to the British public, man, about how much we're spending on asylum seekers and refugees. This is coming out of our foreign aid budget. It can't come out of it forever. And yep. at some point, they're going to have to publish the true cost of this as the years roll on. Well, I keep on repeating myself, saying that we need an emergency stop uh, to our international aid spending. It's as simple as that. We have uh, a huge deficit. We have huge public spending. Mm. We have huge debt. And more important than anything else, we have people right here in this country that need that money more than anything else. Yes, we have a responsibility to help the most in need around the world, 
but that comes with serving our mm. national interest first. Now, uh, if we look at um, our veterans, for example, now Johnny Mercer as a veterans minister has done huge amounts of work to help veterans live a more better, more easier life. But the fact that he's had to be a veterans minister is testament, is an indictment to how bad veterans in this country have had it for so mm. many years, for so long. So far more has to be done domestically first. Okay. Uh, Matthew, I'm just reading here that you know the response from the Labour Party to this affront to the British taxpayer has been Labour's Sarah Champion, who is also the chair of the International Development Select Committee, who actually thinks the bad thing about this is that we're not giving more money abroad. Well, uh, <laughs> this is a, well. This is the government is committed to spending this on international aid, and yet it fudges the figures so that it can spend the money on asylum well, seekers. The, the internationals uh, have come here. Haven't well, well, uh, I think that what we need is an asylum system that works. You mocked the European Pact. The idea of this European Pact is that people are processed in five days, not five years, which is probably the average time uh, uh, that you have in Britain. If, if a country doesn't want to adhere to that pact they can go through a lengthy process that may or may not result in them paying other countries to take more people, which they won't want to do. Yeah, the but the, the key work. thing is, is it's sensible processing at Europe's borders, so you don't... Uh, which hopefully will prevent some people coming here. But if we were... But the, but the problem we've got is that if you take money out of the international aid budget, I think international aid is a valuable thing. I think it's important that a rich country like Britain uh, helps rich. the poorest in the world. But we are compared to if the countries we're that we're giving rich. it to. But we shouldn't be giving money to China. I agree rich. we shouldn't be giving money to then China. Why? We shouldn't be giving money to China, Pakistan, I would say as well. If we're so rich, why are so many of our own people struggling to live? We're not rich. I think we need to get out of that mindset. The government needs to stop talking as though we're some sort of rich nation. We are still comparatively, you know, compared, yeah, compared to... To the countries that we're helping, which is why we must make sure well, that the money only goes to, go to the poorest China. countries, well, which is why money shouldn't go to China. Well, look, I think it's fair to say that, yes, Britain can play its role in the world mm. in terms of helping those mm. in the greatest need. Yes. But, but having said that, I think every single so-called asylum seeker that's come across the channel as a dinghy wala shouldn't be here in the first place. I don't agree with you. With, with, I mean, with the dinghy thing, yes, absolutely. But I don't agree with you that we need to show our thing in the world and stuff. I think you get your own house in order before you start tidying... Well, yes, and that's why we need... I mean, one of the aims of international aid yes, is, is to try and make sure that people are able to stay in the part of the world that they're from and they don't feel the need to cross the world to come here. If foreign, if foreign aid work with should that, mainly, mainly be used to mm. help third world countries, right, what does it say about Britain? So, the quote from the Centre for Global Development think tank, the new figures show record spending on refugee hosting, which, with other domestic spend, mean the government is now spending over 50% mm. of the £9.9 .9 billion bilateral aid budget within the UK. I mean, we are becoming a third-world country. Well, we? that's yeah. right. Well, they're spending it here because the, because the government has completely failed on asylum, because we have a completely failed asylum system, one of the most uh, inefficient uh, uh, in Europe, uh, and one that is costing the British taxpayer tens of millions. Whether you take it out of that pot or that pot, it all comes from the same source, I mean, which is the British taxpayer. So we need an asylum system that works, that processes people quickly, and people who shouldn't be here are sent home. Well, I think we need an asylum system that actually treats actual genuine <coughs> refugees mm. for what they are and not these illegal economic migrants mm. that keep coming up. I mean, let's be honest, the vast majority of them are failed asylum seekers from Germany, from France, from Italy. Mm -hmm. which, which is why we need a system that processes people and sends people back when they, yeah, when they, when they fail. Really, but that doesn't really justify a lot of the money that we are sending in terms of foreign aid to those so-called countries that need the aid to ridiculous well, projects. Well, it's not working. Well, we're, we're sending them to projects where the money is unaccountable. Yes. It's probably ending up in the coffers of a lot of the government people in those corrupt countries. So Somalia, so even Somalia South Sudan, Afghanistan being right out there. I mean, why the heck are we slated to spend £151 million giving the Taliban in Afghanistan, mm. essentially? People might argue it's going to it's for feeding. It's for feeding people who are at risk of yeah, famine that, in that's Afghanistan. That's not going to get there, though, is it? Let's be realistic, Matthew. A lot of those regimes where we're supposed to be sending money to help the people end up in the coffers of dodgy, corrupt... Look, I think we should... Yeah. So I, I think we should always be more efficient in, 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 and we should always make sure that it's, 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 properly, it's properly accounted for. Money, but in places, in some of the most, in most damaged regimes in the world, people, the people paying the price are, you know... I mean, we don't want to see children starving yeah, in these places the as long as the money gets... To the... Things rather than money, you know, maybe they, they need vaccines or something like yes, that. Yes, but it's not, not going not... to subsidise the Taliban regime. It's going to feed people in Afghanistan, and it's going through charities it's... that work on the ground. But there's, there's also a debate to be had. Do we really want to be the world's arbiter when it comes to providing exactly. uh, failed regimes 
with propping them up. I mean, surely, yeah. surely uh, the regions themselves, I mean, let's, let's not kid ourselves. Uh, the Middle East, for example, yes. yeah, it's got absolutely. some of the most richest parts of the world. Absolutely. They're, they're, they're not, not pulling helping. their weight. No, I agree with you. Other countries need to do their bit. And we, uh, and know, it's ego again. No, we and are the fifth largest or sixth largest economy in the world. All yeah, that no, exactly. But look, when, when, when the truth essentially comes out about this, which is that we are only able to mask the expenditure on asylum seekers and refugees for a period of time, right? And, and that period of time is, is frankly coming to an end. £4.3 billion pounds of the foreign aid budget being spent, and of course, uh, that is essentially due to uh, international laws that allow us to uh, class it as foreign aid developments essentially for a period of time. But they're still going to stay here. Mm -hmm. So next year, and the year after that, and the year on. after that, that is just taxpayers' money. They can't keep fudging it. I think when that, when that lands on people, and the reality lands on people, the, you know, governments are going to have a big problem. Well, look, there's only one way to, to, to resolve this, and that is, as I keep on saying, week after a week. You pick them up in the middle of the channel and you drop them back on the French coast. What are the French going to do? Are they going to go to war with us? Good luck finding somebody who's prepared to do yeah, that, no, because I nobody see. in the Royal Navy will well, do that, and no problem. sailors will do that, because it's against international maritime law. Well, well, no, but you're picking them up. You're not dumping somebody, so why can you not send them back? Or, my idea is you've got the cruise ships all lined up. I, I tell you what, if they get on a cruise ship, they will stop coming. Look, if Australia, could do, it, that this is... if Australia could do it, so could we. Mm. It needs political will. That's what it's It's becoming harder ship. and harder and harder to justify the amount of mm. money. And when they're saying we're closing migrant hotels, and then you realise that it's actually going to cost us a huge amount more to have these large sites which can only yeah. host around 800 to 1,000 people in them, which is a fair weather weekend on the English Channel, isn't it, realistically? Um, you look at that, you look at the idea now that they are essentially masking this foreign aid budget uh, and masking the amount of money that we're spending. There's only so long that you can keep this going before actually everybody wakes up. So there we go. Look, coming up... We used to rule Britannia, but now new Royal Navy recruits no longer have to be able to swim, remarkably, <laughs> right? Does the move lay bare the dire state of our armed forces? Former British Army Commander Colonel Richard Kemp makes a splash on that story, but up next in our Head to Head, is Jacob Rees-Mogg right that being on benefits is becoming a lifestyle choice? Entrepreneur and businessman Mike Green, he goes head to head with former Labour Party spokesman James Matthewson and reality star Gemma Lucy. That's on in just a tick. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. Cheryl Baker, good morning, Cheryl. Good morning. When you think back to 1981, um, I mean, obviously, the, 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 the ABBA <laughs> victory then wasn't all that long ago, nine years earlier. Did you think they had a huge influence then on the sort of direction that, that Eurovision was taking? Yeah, they did. They changed it completely. Because up to then, it had all been very and a bit posh, long frock, sticky bow ties, you know. And then they came along and they blew it out of the water. They looked so different. And they modernised it. And I think, yeah, it, it, it made a big change. Made a big change after that. Mm. And we were watching your performance on Eurovision a little bit earlier on of Making Your Mind Up. I mean, you had so much fun, didn't you, up on that stage. Were you, in some part, inspired by ABBA? Um, yes, I would say so. It was... Abba was 74, I turned professional in 75 and um, did my first song for Europe, which was, you know, the when they choose the British song to go forward. Um, I did my first one in February 1976. So, yeah, it was only months after Abba's performance that I, um, I started my own Eurovision journey. Um, yeah, they, they just changed the face of it. They changed the face of Eurovision. And if you look at what Eurovision is now, I think that all started with... ABBA's performance. It made people think this is much more than just a song contest. It's all about the look. I mean, the clothes, because they looked fantastic. And even the composer, or not the composer, what's he called? The conductor. He was dressed as Napoleon. It was, it made it fun. Fantastic song, obviously. Brilliant singing. But the whole look of it just changed the way that Eurovision is. And, and to this day, Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? 
incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. It's Patrick Christie's tonight. Coming up, as the Royal Navy decides its seafaring recruits no longer need to be able to swim, are the British Armed Forces now a laughingstock? Former British Army officer Colonel Richard Kemp has his say. But first, has being on benefits in Britain now become a lifestyle choice? It's time for tonight's Head to Head. Yes, benefit spending is rapidly running out of control, with nearly 4 million people at risk of abandoning work permanently as they continue to be paid out-of-work benefits without any obligation to search for a job. Meanwhile, 2 million more people will be claiming disability benefits by the end of the decade as mental health problems push the cost of the taxpayer up by more than 50%. Those figures alone represent nearly 10% of the entire British population. Speaking on his show last night, GB News' very own Jacob Rees-Mogg suggested what may be going on here. This costs you a fortune, £260 billion a year, and is growing. That's about 20% of all public expenditure, which falls on rich and poor taxpayers alike. And it's the failure to incentivize people to work that then allows it to become a lifestyle choice paid for by others that seems to me to be the problem. OK, so is it a lifestyle choice? Let me know your thoughts by heading to gbnews.com forward slash your say or tweet me at gbnews. And while you're there, make sure you vote in our poll. The results to follow shortly. But first, going head to head on this, our entrepreneur and businessman Mike Green and reality TV star Gemma Lucy. Both of you, thank you very much. Great to have you on the show. Mike, I'll start with you. Is being on benefits a lifestyle choice? Uh, well, I'm not sure it's a choice, but they're certainly not choosing to go to work, are they? They're taking the benefit of such an easy, lacklustre, lazy system that makes it easy for them to stay at home. OK, Gemma, your view, same question. Um, I don't necessarily think it's a lifestyle choice either, but I don't think that the alternative is that great. Minimum wage is awful. I think that people who do get a job, you're working all these hours to make probably not a lot more. And I don't think people are living a good life on benefits either. So when they're choosing or when they are on benefits, it's not like they're living the high life and thinking, this is great, let me just stay on benefits for the rest of my life. It's probably still pretty bad. Um, is that a good enough excuse, though, Mike? Should people not have a bit more personal pride to go out, get up in the morning, go to work? Yeah, they should. But on that point, I can completely agree with Gemma in the sense that the gap between benefits and the lower income earners is too small. We are not paying a livable wage to the people at the bottom end mm. of income. And because of that, you've got people who put in a 40 hour week, maybe even do some overtime, and they're still sofa surfing. They cannot afford to live. It cannot be right that they're only marginally above people on benefits. We should be paying more to those that are willing to work and paying even less to those that want to sit at home and do nothing. Look, I'm, I'm just going to think... uh, introduce a clip. OK, which we've got. So it's indistinguishable. Indist yeah, indistinguishable, really, this, from reality or, or not. I'm going to bring it up now. So this is a chap who's running through his benefits list. I'll talk <clears> you through it, all right? So his income is about 2000 and odd every single month. On that, he breaks down what he can get for that on benefits, all right? So it includes things like booze, uh, sky, sky glass full package uh, there as well, vet bills for some kind of parrot, I think it's right in saying. Uh, all sorts of stuff there, really, uh, on all of that. Uh, a tanning salon as well. 
Uh, phone uh, looks like, uh, yeah, loads, all sorts of stuff. I mean, Gemma, we're paying for this, is that right? Well, that's just one person, what they choose to do with their bills. I mean, their, um, their benefits. But what I think is that there's not enough jobs out there at the minute. And I think this is like a domino effect of all sorts of things, from COVID, from, say, even the education system. I don't even think our education system teaches people enough on how to make money outside of the rat race of society. You know, we're all taught to kind of go into these jobs, work, slave away from 8 in the morning till 8 at night, don't ever see your families. And when those jobs aren't available, nobody really knows what else to do. So I think that it's like a domino effect from all sorts. Oh. And then you go all the way back to COVID, where we were told, don't work, your jobs, you can't go to work. If you've got small businesses that you've spent 20 years building up these businesses, they're now gone, it's scrapped. So, you know, the choices aren't that great. And I think the whole kind of energy of this country is quite depressing and negative. Yeah, but is that not because people are depressing and negative, Mike? I mean, if you have a bit about you, you can go to work, you've always got the chance. Going to work is like buying a lottery ticket. If you go to work and you turn up, you might get promoted. You might go and get that next big job. Your CV is going to look better. A big company somewhere else might come in for you. You might get headhunted. And before you know it, you might have that five-bedroom detached house somewhere in the country and a roaring fire and a cockapoo. Yeah. You know, it's fantastic stuff, all right? But if you don't go to work, you don't have a chance. <clears throat> Patrick, it makes my blood boil. I mentor uh, between 50 and 60 businesses at any point in time, and I've mentored thousands of businesses. I've run my own businesses. Do you know the average single person self-employed business is earning less than that little list you, you just mm. showed me of benefits? Mm. They are working really hard. The government are taxing them. They, they might be turning over more, but by the time they've paid basic costs, they're earning less than that person who's excuse my bluntness, but sitting on their ass. It is about time we made it tougher for these people who don't want to do it. And I also hear from these same people, they are struggling to get people to work. Why? It's too easy for them to be at home. There are jobs. They might not enjoy that job, but if not, learn some more things, get better, do a better job. Get off your butt and don't expect the government to look after you. I don't think you. everybody's lazy, though, who's on benefits. What about single mums who have got three kids and they can't just go to work? They need benefits. They need to pay for their kids. Could, could, I Gemma, I, I that, could, could I ask I you on that? Could I ask you on that, Gemma? On that. Let, let me. Sorry, Matt. Let me just come in here because because I think I, I know a lot of our of viewers and listeners might be screaming at this, Gemma. I'm just keen to get your answer on this. You know, some people might say, "Well, if you if you've got three kids, right? Why should we pay for that? Why why should people have have made that decision to have three kids?" Are you asking me? Gemma, sorry, yeah. I mean, it's not that you should have to pay for it, but I do think there should be some sort of sympathy towards that and a system in place. You know, people have kids by accident. Some people don't believe in abortion. Some people find out afterwards. Some people want to have kids. You know, some people want to make a family and, and that makes them happy. So at the end of the day, there is a benefit system in place and I just think that the strategy needs to be better of who is actually benefiting from it in a way where it is for the reasons such as kids or who is actually sitting on their ass. So okay. I think that we need to try and de um, decipher between the two a lot better. Mike? The, the, the problem is, Gemma, I think that we we maybe both look at slight extreme, extremes. I don't know a single person that I've ever met or mixed with that isn't willing to pay for support, look after the people who are unable or incapable of working. But, but you're the, calling the, everyone on benefits lazy and we're on their ass. About the, we're talking about the millions that are sitting on their asses. My mum had five kids when she was a single mum at one point, OK? She went out early and often took those of us. Uh, one, my sister would stay at home, she'd take a couple of us, we'd help her do a cleaning job. In the evenings when we went to sleep, she did piecework, sewing uh, uh, materials that were bought to her, and she worked while we slept. Everyone so can the, do so something. You're, so you're expecting a woman to look add up to pay oh, okay. for people who aren't oh, willing to work. Like, go on, so you, you're expect, expecting a woman to look after all her kids and then when her kids are asleep, when she's knackered all day, work all night? That's just ridiculous. That's not possible. No. It was tough, but you know what? It taught us a good work ethic. The minute I could work, my brothers could work, my sisters could work, we wanted to look after my mother. Uh, and there was a responsibility within families. She looked after us if we didn't have work. We looked after her when she couldn't work. But so many kids expect to get a flat, expect to get paid, and don't want to work for it. I have no problem with supporting mm. those that can't support themselves. But those that don't want to get off their butt, I, I have a problem with. And then, I and agree then... with you, but I just think that generalising, saying that's what everyone doing on benefits it just I, yeah, I, get, I get that I, I, yeah I, I do I do understand I, and I, I think we you know we've picked the we've picked the I'd say maybe extreme example I don't know you know the, the single man with three kids but but I look at the figures here 10% of the entire British population could well find themselves 
on benefits. Uh, and Gemma, there's no way that 10% of the British population need to be on benefits. And, and even if we upped the minimum wage, yeah, is this not is this not a, a bad case of lazy itis? I don't, I don't think that all the 10%, you know, need to be on benefits. But like I said earlier, I think it's a domino effect from COVID. And I want to just go back to what I said about the education system. I mm. think that people are not learning enough on how to make money outside of society, outside of the rat race, which can be depressing. People like Andrew Tate sort of talk about how to do things like e-commerce brands online and making money online. But I don't think anybody's ready for that conversation. Uh, I, I think that is actually a really, really good point. Mike, I'll give you the final word on this because I actually think that we should be looking at situations like this now in schools. We've done away with a huge number of apprentices or certainly not actively encouraged them. What we have encouraged people to do is to go and do completely rubbish, meaningless university courses that saddle them with a lifetime worth of debt and probably suck the life out of them and drain a few brain cells with the three litres of Frosty Jacks you consume every day at backwater university studying underwater basket weaving. When in fact we could be teaching people, look, this is how you can have a practical trade or this is how you might be able to duck and dive a little bit and this is how you might be able to, you know, make a bit of money completely legally, of course. We don't really do that, do we? No, no listen, I, on my podcast, I've had people like Charlie Mullins of Pimlico Plumbers. I've had Alfie Best, a gypsy billionaire. They didn't go to university. I didn't go to university. I don't know about yourself, Gemma, but... <laughs> In getting out to work, we had to then learn from life. And you know what? I didn't want to do some of the jobs I had yeah. to do. But getting in them, I earned some money. I felt what it was like to earn my own money, to be able to go out for a drink knowing I bought that drink, not more pressure on my mum to pay for that drink. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to get better and do better. And we haven't instilled the work ethic in people. And we're actually demonising apprenticeships and yeah. lower level jobs by basically making people feel a failure if they don't go to university. I completely agree. That is right. not the answer for all young Good. people. Can I just say, both of you, thank you very, very much. That was absolutely top draw stuff, that, for a head-to-head. -head. That's Mike Green now, entrepreneur and businessman, and reality TV star Gemma Lucy. I hope to talk to you again both very, very soon. Look, who do you agree with? Was Jacob Rees-Mogg right that being on benefits is becoming a lifestyle choice? Tracy on X says, anyone who has grown up in a working-class area knows this is the truth and has been the truth for decades. So many people game the system, it's unbelievable. Rachel says, for some, it is a lifestyle choice, but for others, like my husband, it sadly isn't a choice. Oh, gosh. After he was diagnosed with aggressive stage four throat cancer and unable to work since June 2018. And, and I think everyone, Rachel, firstly, obviously we wish you and your husband all the very best. And I don't think those are the kind of people at all that we're talking about when we're having this discussion about benefits. Gary says, I think benefits aren't becoming the choice for illegal migrants, but no one seems to care. Right. Your verdict is now in. 86% of you say that being on benefits is becoming a lifestyle choice. 14% of you disagree that it is not. Right. Coming up. A wet Guardian columnist says the quiet part out loud by declaring that he wants to take the great out of Great Britain. Why do the left hate our country so much? British patriot and former Tory minister Anne Widdicombe has something to say on that very, very shortly. But next, the Royal Navy moves to solve its recruitment crisis by allowing non-swimmers to sign up as sailors. Have we lost the plot? And does this lay bare the dire state of our armed forces? Former British Army commander Colonel Richard Kemp is live and it's next. Good evening. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. Well, it will be a cloudy start tomorrow, but it should brighten up later on in the day. But for the far northwest, we're likely to see fairly persistent rain. High pressure is starting to spread its influence into southern areas of the UK, but further north and west, we'll see weather fronts push in through the next few days. And this evening, much of the rain will be restricted to the far north and west of Scotland. Also, parts of northwest England, Cumbria, will likely see some heavy bursts of rain throughout this evening. Elsewhere throughout the night, it should stay largely dry away from the coasts and over the hills, but it's going to be a very cloudy and mild night. Temperatures again, double digits by for a minimum. Across the far northeast of Scotland, it should be a fairly dry and bright start, perhaps some areas in the Midlands as well. But by and large, it's going to be a fairly cloudy start to the day. It'll likely stay quite cloudy and wet for much of the day across parts of western Scotland, northwest England, Northern Ireland as well. But elsewhere, it should brighten up and it'll feel fairly warm once again in that sunshine. We could see temperatures as high as 21 degrees on Friday. 
That band of rain becomes a more weak feature, but it will sink into more northern areas of Wales, more widely across northern England, perhaps into the Midlands later on in the day and Saturday. Behind it, it turns much more unsettled, some showery outbreaks of rain, and it'll also turn considerably colder for those northwestern areas. But in the south, it should remain largely dry and bright for the weekend. Martin Daubney, weekdays from 3 p.m. This new hate crime bill on women's issues, you think this is the least funny April Fool's joke in history? Yeah, although the Scottish government and the Scottish police do seem to be trying to make a bit of a joke of it when, you know, their campaign Hate Hurts is fronted by a hate monster who's a sort of cuddly, bright red, uh, Muppet style thing. And some of the things that Hamza Yousaf said about it were from a, a soft play centre over the weekend. But yeah, it's really not a joke. It's not actually clever lawyers who know the wording of the law, who enforce the law. It's the police. And the police have basically not been trained on this at all. There's a two hour online training course they're meant to have done, and lots of them haven't already done it. And we know from the way that the police have been talking about it, that they're wildly overstretching what it might actually be to be in particular abusive, which is one of the words in the new law, and specifically on the issue of transgender identity to claim that just noticing the fact that there are two sexes and that sex can't change is meant to be hateful. That you know, even after years of trying to study it, I can't understand why people hold this belief. But it's part and parcel of a pattern of legal measures that the Scottish government has either introduced or has sought to introduce. So it tried to introduce gender self-ID, but that was overruled by Westminster because it was out of the power of the devolved government. It's still attempting to bring in a conversion therapy law, which sounds nice but isn't nice. It actually criminalises proper ethical treatment of gender-confused youngsters. Uh, they're trying to say that uh, men who have certificates saying that their women count as women for a particular measure to do with public boards and then this uh, hate crime law which tries to make it really difficult for someone to talk in a factual reality based clear understandable way about all these measures it all adds up to a sort of an authoritarian attempt to deny the fact that human beings are mammals and come in two sexes and that recognizing that matters for women's rights especially Welcome back to Patrick Christie's Tonight. Loads to get through. No nonsense and Whitcomb on the way. But first, the Royal Navy ruled the waves for centuries with its fearsome fleet of ships and seafarers. Patrolling the Med was a doddle and the French and Spanish were dispatched at Trafalgar. Today, though, it's a different story. Not only do we fail to stop rubber dinghies crossing the Channel, it's now been revealed that new Royal Navy recruits no longer have to prove they can swim before starting training. Defence sources have blasted the move as desperate, a relaxing of standards to tackle the Navy recruitment crisis. If it transpires recruits are not able to pass the Royal Navy swim test, they will remain in phase one basic training while they receive swimming lessons. Asked how the change had gone down internally, a source told Sky, outrage, unadulterated utter outrage. Yeah, it's a race to the bottom, literally the bottom. The Navy defended the move by saying recruitment and retention were priorities and the changes were designed to reduce delays for candidates to join while retaining the same level of swimming ability. Look, I'm joined now by former British Army Commander Colonel Richard Kemp. Colonel Richard, what do you make of this? Is it more or less embarrassing than the time that we uh, allegedly accidentally wired a Royal Navy ship to only be able to go backwards? Well, even though I was I was uh, I was in the army, I was never good enough to join the Royal Navy, even though I could swim. Um, but I think I, I don't actually have a problem with this. I think it's it's perfectly reasonable to allow people to join the navy and train them to swim. It doesn't take a great deal of time. It's not a big deal, and everyone can do it. So I don't think that's a huge issue. I think it's better than letting people come to the recruiting office, try to join the Navy, get told you've got to go away, learn to swim, and get discouraged and do something else. So I think it's OK. What it does do is it indicates, um, it does indicate, the which we know about anyway, the, the growing manpower crisis in the armed forces. Mm. Um, it comes down to two real things. One is the failure to, main, to, to retain people in the Navy and the Army and the Air Force because of poor conditions of service, bad pay, etc., how bad is the pay? Could, could I just it, ask you? Uh, could could I just ask you how, how, roughly how bad is the pay? What kind of pay are we talking about for in the navy? 
I can't I can't tell you that. I'm afraid I don't have that information. But it's it's um it's great, and and it's not so much it's not even the pay. It's the general conditions that that members of the armed forces in all services are subjected to. For example, very poor housing, um, for, particularly for families. So in some cases, very poor barrack accommodation, a cut back in allowances, and various other things like that. And, and due to shortage of manpower, um, it's uh, it come you know it's the, the the unpleasant duties come round more quickly, making people not want to stay. So that's a problem. But I think an even bigger problem than retention is uh, recruiting the forces, the army. I would say, in particular, from my own experience is extremely mm. bad at recruiting people. I'm and just... if the Navy turns people away because they can't swim, mm. the, ar the Army will turn people away if, they've got, if they need a filling until they get the dentist to sort that out, and then they'll go away. Well, look, I would, I would, is that, is that fair, though, so Richard? Is, 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 is that fair, though? Because, look, I mean, I look at the Royal Navy here. It says, oh, this is according to their own website, right? Rating paid day one, £18,500 a year. They then make the case, which, by the way, I think is, is really poor, right? Uh, they then make the case, though, that you've got no rent, no bills, 30 days holiday on full pay, free gym membership, travel for free, and also the possibility to fight and die for your country. Um, the regular job, they say that the average school leaver is on 19 and a half grand but, grand, but they make the case that, again, you've got to pay for all of that other stuff. They say that an officer on day one is on £31,000. So, yeah, look, I agree with you. The pay itself is not particularly uh, appealing. But uh, is this not maybe just a sign, seriously, though, that if you can't swim when you are being recruited for the Navy. I would argue that is more of a concern than whether or not someone is going to be, you know, sent over the top somewhere and needs a, needs a filling. No? Well, I, I think it's part of the same problem because what it does, it discourages people who want to join the Navy from doing so, or the Army. And, and, the, the, and it's just a part of a, a bureaucratic web which seems to me to be designed to prevent people from joining. Some some people can go and apply to join the army and take six months or a year before they get through the process. Mm. I think also the, the swimming thing, I don't have the data. I would guess it applies to a very small number of people, not a huge number. I think most people can probably swim. Maybe I'm wrong. But, yeah, it, I mean, but it's not a big deal. I mean, the dental thing is, is not a big deal. There's a lot of examples, though, of just other aspects of the Royal Navy not particularly working. I mean, quite literally, in the... Um... Uh, in the case of some ships, Royal Navy warships crashed into each other due to uh, being incorrectly rewired. That was in uh, January 2024, uh, apparently. We've had an issue with uh, some aircraft carriers supposedly not really being able to carry any aircraft, which I imagine is, uh, is a slight problem. Is this just a wider symptom of the fact that our actual defence forces are knackered at a time when we arguably need them uh, more than we've ever needed them since World War II? I mean, Putin's not quaking in his boots. We couldn't even fire a nuke off one of them before, but we were told, oh, don't worry, it'll be all right on the night. Well, we'll all be dead by then. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The armed forces are actually knackered. They've got some extremely good people serving in them mm. who are willing to give their country, but they're not funded well enough. And I've no doubt that the engineering problems that the Navy's been experiencing, including the, the missile problem, is down to not enough money being devoted to maintaining ships. And the same applies to the other services. They haven't got enough men they haven't got enough women, they haven't got enough combat equipment, and they haven't got enough, they just haven't got enough money. And and you know, even as as the war in Ukraine's been unfolding and everyone's been talking about how uh, much under threat we are, the British Army and the Navy and the Air Force, but particularly the British Army, has been decreasing in size as we have seen the yeah. threat increase. It's and it's not just a matter of being able to fight, it's also a matter of deterrent. You've got to have you've got to have military strength and demonstrable political will to use it in order to to avoid having well, to fight quite, I, I by agree with you. Or like the enemies. We're going to have to leave it there, and I think we can all agree that it is a bloody good thing that we're giving £151 million to Afghanistan this year. That'll do us the world of good when it comes to stopping people who indeed want to kill us from killing us. That's former British Army Commander Colonel Richard Kemp there, you know, speaking some truths there about the state of our armed forces. Unfortunately, coming up at 10, a flurry of Labour MPs performing screeching U-turns now on the trans debate amid the bombshell cast review. But as Labour's militant leftists like Nadia Whittam refuse to accept the truth, will the party tear itself apart again over the trans issue? And can we trust Labour with our country's kids? 
But next, a self-loathing Guardian columnist says we should take the great out of Great Britain. So, why do these wet leftists hate their own country so much? No-nonsense former Tory Minister Anne Whittacombe, let's rip on that. And it's next. Farage, Monday to Thursday from 7pm. Good evening. Well, I thought it was an absolutely knockout front page of a sun that went online last night and was on display all over the country today. Union joke. And there is. Well, you can just about make out that it's the Union flag, better known perhaps as the Union Jack, but they've decided to add pink and all sorts of colours to it. And that is on sale uh, for fans going to the Olympics in France this year to buy and to wear, which led to a great big panic. What on earth would be on the shirts, shorts and kit of the athletes? Well, a statement did come out mid-morning from the British Olympic Association, which said all Team GB athletes will wear the Union Jack as normal in Paris. However, Team GB kit itself is expected to include different shades of blue or red as in previous years. Well, I'm sorry, I don't really buy that. Now, we sent Adam Cherry out to Wembley today to ask some members of the public how they felt about this. This episode of Companies Fixing Things That Weren't Broken. We're going to be asking the people of London what they think of the changing colours of the Team GB Olympic logo. Take a look at this. The blue, the red and the, the white, it's perfect. I feel like, you know, it shouldn't be that controversial, controversial but, you know, it's iconic. I feel like the, yeah. the, the colours are iconic. Everyone's known London for being, you know, red, white and blue. I feel like it doesn't really represent England like that. Yeah, the, yeah. the colours of the... Like the colours are kind of random. I, I think it's very colourful. Mm. It's very uh, pinkish and uh, quite unicornish kind of thing, yeah. A bit too unicornish for Team GB. A little bit. Disgusting. Well, we're British. And our colours are not pink and what purple and... So, like, you know, some patterns on there. Yeah, it's yeah, all yeah, going crazy. That's, that's not our flag. Yeah. That don't represent me. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Welcome back to Patrick Christie's Tonight. Now, coming up at 10, Shadow Health Secretary Wes Streeting has pulled a screeching U-turn in the trans debate. He's one of many, by the way, after the publication of the cash report. But do you really trust Labour with your kids? First, though, we welcome former Tory minister Anne Widdicombe. And the columnists over at The Guardian have found a new way of attacking the nation with Martin Kettle, who looks to be... A very cheery bloke. Look at that. Good at parties is Martin. Writing the following tripe about reviving Britain. Look, central to national renewal will be articulating a more nuanced and inclusive sense of ourselves and of our country in a place of preposterous and exclusive one. In this rebuilding, national boastfulness will be as out of place as national self-loathing. Occasionally I flirt... He's not flirted with anything for a while, is he? Occasionally I flirt with the fantasy of a new statue to rename this country simply Britain. That's not going to happen, but it's still true that Britain needs to get beyond the rhetoric and thinking of itself as Great Britain. If it can, this really might be a greater place for us all. And when did people on the left start hating Britain? Well, I don't know, but what I do know is that if a country is great and thinks of itself as great and calls itself great, that is of a benefit to every single citizen in it, man, woman and child. 
uh, because you want your country to be great. You want it to be successful. You want it to be economically vibrant. You want it to be all those things. And you want it to be a country that other people respect. And people will say, yes, you know, isn't Britain doing well? Um, so, of course, we want our country to be great. And, and this is just some, you know, vacuous nonsense, quite honestly. Yeah, I mean, he doesn't look like a particularly happy chap. He looks exactly like the kind of guy who might wander around everywhere and going, oh, I just, I just hate this place. Now, viewers and listeners might think, well, hang on a minute, you spent the first section of this show slagging off our foreign aid thing, saying we're getting it wrong on immigration. You're doing a section later on in the show about how our NHS is knackered. Patrick, you have a go at Great Britain all the time. But that is, and because I do think this place is great and I want to restore it to its former greatness. And there's a difference, isn't there? Well, I mean, I think it's very simple to test. Uh, you know, if you say you don't think this country is great, where would you prefer to live? You know, where would you actually want to go? Mm. Uh, and if the answer is that you want to stay here despite things going wrong, things will always go wrong in any country. We are not alone. The one thing I do get irritated by is that we always talk about what's wrong with Britain totally out of context with what's going on everywhere else. Um, and uh, you know, we're not uniquely... Uh, in a mess. Every country that suffered COVID is in a mess. We're not unique. Uh, so uh, it, unless uh, he can tell me where he would prefer to live, uh, then Britain's great. It remains to be seen whether or not Mr Kettle has a second home anywhere. But if he's writing columns to The Guardian, there's every chance he does, I suppose. Um, and just, just on that, though, is, is there a problem with the psychology of the left? Instead of wanting to maybe build Britain up and see it standing on its own two feet and really tub-thumping and going for it, there is this idea that we need to accept decline. No, we don't need to accept decline. Indeed, it's very dangerous to accept decline. Uh, a, cl a decline needs to be arrested not just, you know, uh, accepted um, as if the, there's no possibility of challenge. Uh, so, no, we don't accept decline. Of course you accept that things change. You know, we're not a great imperial power anymore, and I shouldn't think we want to be. Uh, but, uh, you know, things change, but that doesn't mean we accept decline, which is a different concept altogether. OK, all right. Now, look, I'm going to move it on, because Rishi Sunak's gradual smoking ban will be brought to the Commons next week. It's designed to gradually phase out smoking by increasing the legal age limit every single year. That means Brits who turn 15 this year will never be able to buy cigarettes or cigars. Not everyone's happy. When I look at some of the things that we're, we're, we're doing now, I think that, or that are being done in the name of conservatism, I think they're absolutely... Absolutely nuts. So we're banning cigars. Mm. I and mean, what, what, what is, I mean, maybe that you, maybe you all think that's a great idea. I just can't, I just can't see, well, what, the, what is the point of banning with well, the, the party of Winston Churchill wants to ban, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, donnez don moi un break, as they say in Quebec. You know, it, it's, it's just, it, it's just, it's just mad. Is it just mad, Anne? Oh, absolutely lunatic. And I can't believe that he's uh, giving any time uh, to this at all. Uh, under his proposal, which is that the uh, age at which you can legally buy a cigarette uh, will increase year upon year. Under these proposals, there will come a time when a 44-year-old commits an offence if he buys a cigarette for a 43-year-old. I mean, yeah. that is the extent of the lunacy. Now, you know, I can think of a lot of things that the people in this country are worried about. Uh, they're worried about the economy, they're worried about the NHS, they're worried about defence, mm. they're worried about a whole load of things. I do not believe that anybody is worried uh, about a 44-year-old buying a cigarette for a 43-year-old, which is what this legislation comes down to. He is completely balmy to be doing this, and it won't last, it won't survive. Well, no, he might actually face a rebellion on it, which would mean that one of only two things that he dared to suggest as policies in his conference speech would already be blown out of the water. So there we go. Look, and uh, we're going to move it on to something a bit more, I think, well, profound, meaningful, maybe. Uh, you're joining us from Essex this evening, I believe, after spending your day in South End giving a speech on behalf of the family of Sir David Amos, a statue of the former MP who was tragically murdered by the Islamist knifeman back in 2021, was also unveiled with guests, including Pretty Patel and Andrew Rosendale. Uh, and could you just talk to us a little bit about this, please? An emotional day, I imagine. A very emotional day indeed. And uh, the, the, the widow was present. Uh, and also an awful lot of people whom David Amos had helped uh, while he was a Member of Parliament had come along uh, to pay their respects and to honour him. 
The statue is magnificent. It captures his expression exactly. I didn't know what it was going to be like. It is done absolutely brilliantly. And when you look at it, you can see David and you could, think... Could we just, he's... just while Anne's talking, is there any chance I might be able to just bring, remind ourselves of what that statue looks like in, in just a second as well? Because, Anne, you were saying, yes, yeah, so this is a, a vitally important thing to remember a great man, isn't it? Uh, it is. And, and he was a great man and he was admired on, on both sides of the House uh, in Parliament. Uh, but he always had a ready grin, and there it is on his face um, in that statue, and that is uh, that is David. That is David to a T. Mm. And of course, we remember that he was murdered uh, by a Muslim fundamentalist. Yes, indeed, and it's important not to forget that, although it was, for my money, all too easily forgotten at the time because his death seemed to signify why we need to clamp down on stuff on social media and not actually Islamist terrorism, which I did find a little bit bonkers. So it seemed like, you know, yet another example of rearranging the decking on the Titanic. And, but, um, uh, look, he was, a, he was a tremendous man. I, I only wish that we maybe had a few more like him in, in Parliament, Anne. I, I wish we had a whole parliament full of David Amos's, but I'm afraid uh, if you look at the quality of parliament at the moment, it is appalling. Uh, and parliament in, in the sense of both houses, both the House of Commons and the House of Lords, and indeed for that matter, the civil service. Uh, it's the lowest quality oh. I can ever remember. All right, and thank you very much as ever. That is a wonderful Anne Widdicombe. Coming up, Rishi Sunak takes a victory lap as it's revealed the NHS waiting list dropped for the fifth month in a row, but with junior doctors pledging to strike again, are they going to be to blame for bulging waiting lists? I'll be joined by former Environment Secretary Ranil Jaya Wardner. But next, Labour MPs are performing screeching U-turns on the trans debate. Would you trust Labour with your kids? And can you forgive them for getting it so badly wrong? That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Good evening. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. Well, it will be a cloudy start tomorrow, but it should brighten up later on in the day. But for the far northwest, we're likely to see fairly persistent rain. High pressure is starting to spread its influence into southern areas of the UK, but further north and west, we'll see weather fronts push in through the next few days. And this evening, much of the rain will be restricted to the far north and west of Scotland. Also, parts of northwest England, Cumbria, will likely see some heavy bursts of rain throughout this evening. Elsewhere throughout the night, it should stay largely dry away from the coasts and over the hills, but it's going to be a very cloudy and mild night. Temperatures again, double digits by, for a minimum. Across the far northeast of Scotland, it should be a fairly dry and bright start, perhaps some areas in the Midlands as well. But by and large, it's going to be a fairly cloudy start to the day. It'll likely stay quite cloudy and wet for much of the day across parts of western Scotland, northwest England, Northern Ireland as well. But elsewhere, it should brighten up and it'll feel fairly warm once again in that sunshine. We could see temperatures as high as 21 degrees on Friday. That band of rain becomes a more weak feature, but it will sink into more northern areas of Wales, more widely across northern England, perhaps into the Midlands later on in the day and Saturday. Behind it, it turns much more unsettled, some showery outbreaks of rain. It'll also turn considerably colder for those northwestern areas. But in the south, it should remain largely dry and bright for the weekend. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Variety Cruises have been sailing since 1942, and thanks to them, you could set sail in 2025. You have the chance to win a seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With your flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, you can choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. You'll also win an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash that you can use to make this summer spectacular. We'll also treat you to these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 
Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. It's 10 p.m. I'm Patrick Christie's tonight. Goodness me, that speech was probably one of the worst transphobic dog whistle speeches that I've heard in an awful long time. No forgiveness for Labour trans lunatics and you still go and work abroad somewhere like Canada or Australia, do you think? It's, I'm not ruling it out in the future. NHS waiting lists are down, a win for Sunak plus. Very confident in Angela. Confident? I'm very confident in Angela Rayner. I'm 100% confident. Angela Rayner gets the kiss of death also. Out of their minds, flesh eating zombie drug that's coming to the UK. I've got tomorrow's front pages with GB News star Nana Aquir, founder of Global Britain, Amon Bagal, and ex Labour advisor Matthew Laza. Oh, and what did Trump order? I have 30 milkshakes and also some chicken. Yeah, there was more than that. Get ready, Britain. Here we go. You can't trust Labour with your kids. Next. At just after 10 o'clock, the latest top story from the GB newsroom. A sub-postmistress who was wrongly jailed while she was pregnant has refused to accept the apology of a post office executive who sent an email in 2010 saying her conviction was brilliant. David Smith told the post office inquiry today that with hindsight he understood the anger and upset, as well as the substantial distress he'd caused to Seema Misra and her family, saying he was sorry for the way his email had been perceived and portrayed. Mrs Misra was falsely accused of stealing £74,000 and had to give birth wearing a probation tag. She said, I was eight weeks pregnant at the time. They need to apologise to my son. It was terrible. Between 1999 and 2015, more than 900 sub-postmasters were accused, um, were prosecuted due to flawed Horizon IT software. In other news today, a Moroccan asylum seeker on trial for the murder of a pensioner in Hartlepool told police he was motivated by the conflict in Gaza. 45-year-old Ahmed Ali denies murdering 70-year-old Terence Carney, as well as the attempted murder of his housemate Javed Nouri last October. He says he carried out the attacks as an act of revenge for, he said, Israel's killing of children in the Palestinian conflict. He's also accused of assaulting two female police officers who'd interviewed him after his arrest. The Royal Mail says it's working to remove counterfeit stamps from circulation after an increase in reports of fakes being sold in shops and online. The Telegraph reports today China is flooding Britain with counterfeit Royal Mail stamps, with small retailers buying forgeries online. It's understood the fakes were causing a rise in complaints when stamps bought from legitimate stores were being deemed fraudulent, resulting in a £5 fine for the receiver. A once-a-day migraine pill has been recommended for use on the NHS, with a charity claiming it could change the lives of thousands of people. The pill, sold under the brand name of Equipta, has been given the green light for NHS use under new final draft guidance. Anyone who experiences at least four migraines a month and has tried at least three other methods of treatment but found no relief will be eligible. 
And the former American footballer O.J. Simpson has died of cancer at the age of 76. He was surrounded by his family, who released a statement this afternoon saying he was with his grandchildren and his children at the time. O.J. Simpson was acquitted of killing his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend Ron Goldman in 1994 in a trial that gripped America. Almost 100 million people watched live television coverage of the now-famous pursuit of O.J., driving a white Ford Bronco, followed by multiple police cars across L.A. After his record-breaking career in football, he became an actor, but in 2008 he was convicted for his role in a Las Vegas armed robbery and served almost nine years in prison. That's the news. For the latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Would you trust the Labour Party with your kids? Labour MPs drank the transgender Kool-Aid. They are responsible for turning the trans debate toxic. They are responsible for encouraging this madness. Madness that was revealed by yesterday's cash reports have been nothing more than experimentation on vulnerable children by unhinged activists and medical professionals who many think should now face criminal prosecution. Here's Labour MP Nadia Whittam's reaction. She essentially said that trans children's health and well-being should not be in front in a toxic culture war. She got community noted for that, actually. It's not linked to a toxic culture war, it said. It is all about whether or not a radical ideology had gripped the NHS and was ruining kids' lives. But thank you, Nadia, for giving me the opportunity now to highlight how it was Labour MPs who were and are the toxic ones in this discussion. Step forward. Lloyd Russell Moyle, Labour MP for Brighton, Kemp Town, and the leader of the Socialist Campaign Group. Being unhinged, vile, threatening and disgusting towards a fellow MP who wanted to stand up against trans madness. Goodness me, that speech was probably one of the worst transphobic dog whistle speeches that I've heard in an awful long time. The idea of linking trans people with predators, frankly, is disgusting and you should be ashamed. But the reality of this is, this section 35 is the new Tories section 28. It is their continuation of a war against a group of people, their culture war, that they want to pursue. What about Labour MPs jeering their own colleague Rosie Duffield when she wanted to stand up for women's spaces? Flicks with the Equality Act and would have repercussions for women, for women across the UK. Does the secretary necessarily segregated by sex, such as domestic violence settings, changing rooms and prisons? And given the previous UQ, does he not understand how vitally important this is at the moment? What about MP Kate Osborne barefaced lying about Kemi Badenoch? We are seeing, I would say, almost an epidemic of young gay children, young gay children being told that they are trans and being. Yes, OK. Oh, what about that time that Labour MPs filibustered about ferrets to block a parliamentary debate on protecting biological sex for children? I, I thought um, it, I would take the opportunity, as it hasn't been taken many times uh, during this session of Parliament, to actually talk about ferrets a little more. On April the 2nd, National Ferret Day will be marked. The risk of rabies from illegally imported ferrets. And Ferrets, ironically, absolutely stink. And so has Keir Starmer's attitude towards women, helping to push this trans madness even more. Look, I'm not... I don't think we can conduct this debate with, you know... Sorry, have I, I, get I offended this you in some way? No, 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 it's just... Uh, no, 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 I just... And now here comes the utterly shameless shadow Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper, taking the high ground now on this report. Well, I hope that this report really is a watershed moment for the NHS, for NHS gender services, because this is... It, the, the report's clear. It's basically talking about evidence, focusing on evidence, focusing on children's welfare. And Where were you, Yvette? Where were you when it mattered? Here's Labour Shadow Health Minister West Streetening welcoming the report. If you'd asked me a few years ago uh, on this topic, I would have said... Trans men are men, trans women are women, some people are trans, get over it, let's move on. This is, this is all blown out of proportion. People right. were trying to raise the facts. Do you regret? I think you we've got regret? To, I absolutely take the criticism on the chin. And... 
Well, it's all too little too late, isn't it? The fact is, if it wasn't for the Tories, there wouldn't be an attempt to stop social transitioning against parents' wishes in schools. There would be little to no opposition to male rapists in women's prisons, to hairy blokes in women's changing rooms. There would have been no cash report, would there? Kids would still be mutilated. The Tavistock would still be a thing. You can bet your bottom dollar that Labour wouldn't have done a thing about it. Now, when you go to the polls, maybe just think, would you leave Labour alone with your kids? Let's get the thoughts of my panel this evening. I am joined by GB News presenter Nana Queer, founding chairman of Global Britain UK, Aman Bagal, and also ex-Labour advisor Matthew Laza. Nana, can you trust Labour with your kids? Uh, well, I mean, they have shown themselves to be ridiculous. I mean, Keir Starmer, I, I can't get over that one when he was, when he was asked about whether women have ever been singers. Well, uh, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know what he was doing with his hands, but this is something that my six-year-old could tell you the difference between a man and a woman and has no problem saying that. I don't understand why they struggled with it um, so much. But I think it's interesting that now people like West Streeting are coming out and trying to garner favour mm. because they've realised that, frankly, the cash report, which I'm so glad has come back again and has empowered people to accept and acknowledge that a biological man is a biological man. A woman is a woman. A bi what biological woman is a woman? A woman can never be a man. Yeah. A man can never be a woman. Somebody who thinks that is suffering from something and whatever how that is. How dare Labour MPs and people associated with him now come out and start saying the most important thing is uh, that we have to remove the toxicity from this debate? Excuse me, you were the ones ranting and raving about transphobes, trying to cost people their jobs, trying to mm. cost people their livelihoods, trying to take everything from them. Mm. Well, look, I think I agree with you, Nana. Uh, look, Labour and the left love a good picket line, mm. right? Their radar, their political radar is always focusing on finding full outrage, div driving division, and finding outrage where there isn't actually any. Look, the vast majority of people in the UK, they are pretty happy to let people be, OK? Mm. But Labour, I mean, West Reading, Keir Starmer can't work out what a woman is. I mean, at the end of the day, this is, <laughs> this is an affront to women, to womanhood, to the very idea of being a woman. That's what this is. All right, uh, Matthew, you know, I, I look at this now and I just think if it had been a Labour government in all of this time, there would have been no real pushback to social transitioning in schools. The cash report almost definitely would never have I don't happened. Know, there's no happen. evidence that the cash report wouldn't have happened at all. Labour supported the cash report uh, all the way along. Look, Who the, commissioned it? The, well, the, gov the, 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 the government. Covered, wasn't it? Yes, but the government... because we're you not. Think in that would have happened under a Labour government? Yes, really? absolutely. We're really? not in government. But, look, well, on, uh, uh, look, on the... I mean, Patrick, I think saying that you can't trust Labour with your kids is actually pretty offensive. Uh, uh, both to the Labour Party and to the 40-plus um, uh, percent of people in this country who say that they're going to vote Labour at the next election. I mean, I think what is absolutely clear is that the, the trans debate is too, it has been too toxic and it has been wrong that people have been closed down. I, I'm, I'm going to say quite clearly, I think that... Uh, uh, the, I always get his name wrong, Lloyd Russell Moyle, mm. uh, uh, who is the MP for Power for Brighton, uh, was uh, unhinged there and his behaviour was utterly inappropriate uh, and so did the majority of Labour MPs. West Streeting, who used to work for Stonewall, has been absolutely clear that as... The, as as he's he, he's been on a journey about how the debate is handled. Well, what about because the we're... treatment of Rosie Duffield? Exactly. Yeah. Scared exactly. to go to her own party conference because she dared to say exactly. that only women have a certain... Well, I think that's partly because we... there were campaigners yeah, but, but, at the no, conference, no, no, not no, Labour no. people at the conference. No, no, but it was. It was It was the Labour well, Party, look, and she way. spoke about it. Exactly. I mean, look... Well, she's just been... She's, she, the, the disciplinary is, procedures against her have just been dropped this, for things that she did with, about, against what, other colleagues. This is yeah. nothing but another U-turn from Labour. No, it's not I'll tell you... Look, let me explain. Look, Labour Party is made up of fringe elements. Mm. That's what it is. That's absolute rubbish. No, it's not. It no. is. The Labour Party You've speaks for the majority right. of British right. people. No, but you, we just right. had 20 no, no, minutes no, no, attacking the Labour Party. The Labour Party has a, a, a screeching U-turn from West Streeting on, mm. on, on, on the trans debate. They had a screeching U-turn on the pride we should all show to the union flag. The Labour Party has... No, that's right. absolutely no, no, offensive. Right. And that's, that's look, I mean, I can, I can show you pictures of Labour conferences going back 50 years that have got the union flag in the minutes on the party Let's membership card. Say Labour's not now. patriotic. Okay. It's ludicrous. Right, stop. Let's so keep on the, the, on the, on, oh, on the well, civic well. issue. Wes has not done a U-turn on his policy as Shadow Health Secretary. Wes Streeting, who I've known for 20-odd years, 25 years, mm -hmm. was the president of the NUS, uh, the National Union of Students, mm -hmm. which is a very different kettle of fish to being a Labour MP. You've got different pressure pressures on you, etc. Oh. 
Oh. And he has said that the posters, and he wasn't in charge of Stonewall, he worked <laughs> for Stonewall, um, and he thinks that their, their, their use of the phrase, get over it, for saying some people are trans, get over it, was a, was, was a silly blunt well, poster. Well, well, you know, you've got Labour MPs now just refusing to accept the result of this. You know, Nadia... She doesn't... I mean, I, look, again, she's not from my wing of the party, and often I disagree well, with Nadia Whitmore. What she says... I told you that Labour's fragmented and now... It, it isn't fragmented on it at all. It's, it's united. Well, well, not, because, not, because we all come from different not, traditions. Not, I mean, you know, there's different positions within all parties, especially the Tories. Yeah. What Nadia Whitmore has said is that yesterday her thoughts were with the trans community. Well, and we must remember that the trans well, community well, suffer well, unduly from hate crime, from suicide and from mental health issues. Now, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't back the CAS report. Your information about the trans community suffering more than other All the statistics show that. Well, let's compare the trans community to women. Women suffer more than the trans community. Look, as far as West treating is concerned, I think he's still stuck in his student activist taste. Not at all. He is. Look, he, this is the same man who a few years ago apologised for sending these violent, abusive tweets oh, as a student goodness. activist. Do you remember that? I remember that. I think he's still stuck in his student Look, activist. Look, if Wes wasn't affected, the Tories wouldn't be trying to come for him because they know he's one of our most effective spokespeople. Well, he's just done a massive U-turn and said that, uh, you know, well, we need to get over the fact that well, he thought that a trans woman is a woman. I, I just, I just can't help but feel, you know, you've got the likes of Yvette Cooper out there saying, "Now, look, I really hope now this is, this is going to," and you know, facts are, are really put forward. For I don't remember Yvette mm. Cooper really speaking out about this kind of stuff before. It's like they're hiding behind this report now. now. Well, they now realise that this report won't really back up some of their sort of so-called narrative towards uh, biological women yeah. who make up over 50% of the population. And they realise now they need to garner our support because Keir Starmer is, ha will not have a dead cert of a win, even though he probably will win, but how well good that will be. But I just think that, you know, it's time for people to start telling the truth and telling these people, look, a trans woman is a biological man. A woman is a woman, a biological I, woman is a woman, and yeah. for anybody to say anything and, different... And I think that's a real... Somebody who's a leader of a party, and you know what? somebody who's representing a political party... And you know what, Nana? Madness. I, th I think Labour are trying finally to become mainstream and say, you know what, most people... Is agree with what you just said. Well, of course, it's quite straightforward. They've had to be nudged along the way, though, Matthew. They've really had to be nudged ages. along the way. Go Look, I think, I think uh, we must also forget a sight in this. this. The CAS report is about services for under-18s. There are people who transition and they should be shown uh, support and, and given rights, which is what has happened for 25 years under, under How both parties. How many Labour MPs were really crying out about the Tavistock Clinic? Mm. Uh, not enough MPs of any party were crying out about the Tavistock Clinic. Didn't Labour back at the SNP as well with their Gender Recognition Reform Bill as well? I mean, well, Labour's absolutely easier. clear it does not believe in itself. Well, UK Labour doesn't believe in, 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 in gender self-ID and that is the very clear policy. Well, people, Back people, by Keir. people can make their own minds up, can't they, as to mm. whether or not children, vulnerable children, the CAS report, again, may I remind everybody, did identify that neurodiverse children, often with other situations okay. going on, like autism and other different things as well, had essentially been pushed in a direction. People can make their own minds up as to whether or not a Labour government would have done anything about that. Matthew thinks they would have done. No doubt West Streeting himself would visit vehemently say that he would have done, I'm not so sure. Coming up, don't miss the extraordinary moment that a Hamas leader is actually told that his children and grandchildren have been killed in an airstrike. His reaction, if you've not seen it already, perhaps explains some of the senseless evil that took place in October the 7th. But next, Rishi Sunak celebrates NHS waiting list dropping for the fifth month in a row, despite missing his own targets that he set last year. But with junior doctors pledging to continue striking until September, will they be to blame now if the waiting lists start to bulge again? Former Environment Secretary Ranil Jaya Wardner, he takes striking doctors to task, and that's next. GB News Breakfast. Every day from 6 a.m. Cheryl Baker, good morning, Cheryl. Good morning. When you think back to 1981, um, I mean, obviously, the, 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 the ABBA <laughs> victory then wasn't all that long ago, nine years earlier. Do, do you think they had a huge influence then on the sort of direction that, that Eurovision was taking? Yeah, they did. They changed it completely. Because up to then, it had all been very stayed and a bit posh, long frock, sticky bow ties, you know. And then they came along and they blew it out of the water and they looked so different. And they modernised it. And I think, yeah, it, it, it made a big change. Made a big change after that. Mm. And we were watching your performance on Eurovision a little bit earlier on of Making Your Mind Up. I mean, you had so much fun, didn't you, up on that stage. Were you, in some part, inspired by ABBA? Um, yes, I would say so. It was... 
Abba was 74. I turned professional in 75 and um, did my first song for Europe, which was, you know, the when they choose the British song to go forward. Um, I did my first one in February 1976. So, yeah, it was only months after Abba's performance that I um, I started my own Eurovision journey. Um, yeah, they, they just changed the face of it. They changed the face of Eurovision. And if you look at what Eurovision is now, I think that all started with ABBA's performance. It made people think this is much more than just a song contest. It's all about the look. I mean, the clothes, they looked fantastic. And even the composer, or not the composer, what's he called, the conductor, he was dressed as Napoleon. It was, it made it fun. Fantastic song, obviously, brilliant singing, but the whole look of it just changed the way that Eurovision is, and, and to this day. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. It's Patrick Christie's tonight, and I've got all of tomorrow's newspaper front pages coming your way very, very soon. But first, Rishi Sunak was today celebrating a fall in NHS waiting lists for the fifth month in a row, with 7.5 million treatments waiting to be carried out at the end of February. That is down from their peak of 7.8 million in September last year. Well, this is this is good, isn't it? Things moving in the di direction. Despite the list falling by 36,100 from January to February, it is emerging that exactly 36,100 people waiting for an appointment in the community were not included in the data. Ah casting doubt on the government's claims to be making progress on waiting lists. Well, look, speaking to GB News today, Labour Shadow Health Secretary Wes Streeting, he wasn't celebrating. I don't know why Rishi Sunak's doing a victory lap. Waiting lists are higher than they were when he became Prime Minister. He's promised to cut NHS waiting lists. And you also look at the performance standards on things like A&E, uh, ambulance response times, they are shockingly bad to the extent that People can no longer be certain that whether they dial 999 with suspected heart attack or stroke or walk into A&E, that they're going to be seen on time. Um... Yeah, right, OK, fine. But in a sense, they've dropped for five months in a row. And the government's analysis also shows that had junior doctors in England not walked out in February, 430,000 extra patients could have been treated. And with GPs now also threatening to go on strike, hour-long queues for appointments outside GP surgeries, like this one in South London today, well, they could become the norm, couldn't they? So with more strikes on the cards for later this year, will striking doctors be to blame if NHS waiting lists rise again? I'm joined now by former Environment Secretary and Tory MP Ranil Jaiwardner. Ranil, thank you very much. There is a case to say you're fudging the numbers a little bit by not including the amount of people waiting for an appointment in the community. Yeah, I mean, yeah, let's deal with that head on. Uh, I never like it when the basis of stats change. But there is a good story underneath this, which is that, uh, you know, when 
junior doctors have not been striking. I remember looking at some data late last year. When they weren't striking, we are getting the numbers down. And it is absolutely crucial that uh, we all hold junior doctors to account because even the NHS's own medical director has said that it's the industrial action that's had a significant impact. And the idea that um, a 35% pay rise is affordable is just not true. Any of your viewers uh, know that is not true. Um, and, you know, that's based on uh, a campaign that has tried to mislead people, I'm sorry to say, into thinking that all junior doctors earn, you know, £32,000 a year, when actually many earn mm. as much as £92,000 a year and have a very generous pension. So we are putting money into the NHS. Um, there's more money going in than ever before, three billion every week is going into the NHS. Well, yes. Um, and uh, there's no shortage of money, but now it's time for the I'm, doctors, I'm gonna come, I'll, the I'll, doctors I'll, to think carefully. I'll, I'll focus in on the junior doctors and quite possibly GPs as well very soon. But I've got to ask, are you being outflanked by West Streeting and the Labour Party here? He was quoted earlier on today as saying that if he could use the private sector entirely to clear the NHS backlog, he would. I mean, he can say that because he wears a red rosette. You can't say it, can you? Well, I... I'm delighted uh, to say that I think Wes is, is, a, is a great guy um, and I'm delighted that the Labour Party has caught up with Conservative policy, uh, Conservative doctrine, that we should, of course, focus on the patient. Uh, it shouldn't be around who is necessarily delivering the service. It should be around the best outcomes for the patient. And I know in my ne neck of the woods, not only have we got two new hospitals coming in, in the NHS, but our GPs do refer people to local private hospitals where mm. that means a quicker or better result. And that's a good thing. OK, um, yeah, let's come on to the junior doctors now. Yeah, a lot of people have a huge amount of sympathy for them for the obvious reason, right? You know, these people are training to save lives and, you know, there's this kind of de facto idea, I think, isn't it, that these are all very, very good people who are unfairly treated. I do wonder now, you know, five months in a row of waiting lists falling, let's say that continues, there's no reason to expect it won't for the next couple of months, and then they time a strike in time for the next election, which, by the way, they are saying that they might do. You know, I just wonder whether or not it is them to blame, really, if those waiting lists start going up, and if that really does look political. Yeah, well, I mean, as, as I said a moment ago, the ne National Medical Director um, of the NHS, so this is a, an official, this is not a politician, uh, that he has said, uh, Sir Stephen has said, that the industrial action has had a significant impact uh, on the recovery of the NHS services. And you're right to talk about not only junior doctors, but GPs too. Um, on junior doctors, it's absolutely crucial um, that uh, they look after patients. That's what they did sign up to do. I do believe that. Um, mm. But unfortunately, I think there are a small group of, um, dare I say, Corbynistas still in um, parts of the junior BMA um, who are trying to push a political argument. And it's interesting to see they've accepted a deal from the SNP on a very mm. similar basis to what the UK government has said for England. Um, and yet, because we're a Conservative government, these Corbynistas have said no. Um, so one rule with the Scot Scottish nationalists, uh, another rule because we're Conservatives. And you're also right uh, to just highlight that there's a risk of a GP strike um, yeah. over the summer, which again seems very targeted and timed ahead of an election, which is very unfortunate. Actually, I think GPs do a great job. Um, mm. And, you know, it's just important that we make sure that there are appointments um, for patients to be able to see them when they want, uh, where they want. Um, and a strike yeah. isn't going to help with that. Yeah, OK, all, all right. And um, you seem to say there that, you know, if there's a strike in the summer, that would be convenient timing with an election. Are we getting a summer election, Ronald? <laughs> well, no, um, I was actually inferring that on the basis of this November election, uh, a strike over the summer would be very unfortunate ahead of it. Look, I, I am, um, as I said before, uh, on your show, Patrick, I'm delighted. I'd be delighted to take my case to people in my constituency um, uh, whenever the election is called. Uh, you know, we've got now over 2,000 doctors, over 5,000 there's 5,000 nurses in our local hospitals. We've got a good record on this and other things. So uh, bring it on, I say. All right. Okay. 
I better cancel my summer holiday. Ranil, thank you very much. <laughs> you take care. I'll see you in a bit. All the best. That's right. I'll warn you there. It's the former Environment Secretary. Right, a BNA spokesperson said this. The Prime Minister cannot continue to blame doctors for rising waiting lists when, in reality, they have been consistently increasing while successive Conservative governments have been in power. This all comes down to long-term underinvestment in the NHS and an undervaluing of staff, which has crippled our workforce. The government must get credible pay offers on the table to end all disputes and and give our workforce the recruitment and retention boost. It desperately needs to bring those figures down. Right, there we go. Coming up, is Donald Trump the people's president? The former commander-in-chief has staff laughing as he puts in a generous food order for voters in Atlanta. You don't want to miss that video. His full order is actually astonishing. It's like, well, it used to be like me after a night out. But next in my press pack, tonight's panel and I will bring you the very first of tomorrow's newspaper front pages. It's the liveliest paper of you. You'll get anywhere on British TV. Why the heck would you want to miss it? Good evening. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. Well, it will be a cloudy start tomorrow, but it should brighten up later on in the day. But for the far northwest, we're likely to see fairly persistent rain. High pressure is starting to spread its influence into southern areas of the UK, but further north and west, we'll see weather fronts push in through the next few days. And this evening, much of the rain will be restricted to the far north and west of Scotland. Also, parts of northwest England, Cumbria, will likely see some heavy bursts of rain throughout this evening. Elsewhere throughout the night, it should stay largely dry away from the coasts and over the hills, but it's going to be a very cloudy and mild night. Temperatures again, double digits by, for a minimum. Across the far northeast of Scotland, it should be a fairly dry and bright start, perhaps some areas in the Midlands as well. But by and large, it's going to be a fairly cloudy start to the day. It'll likely stay quite cloudy and wet for much of the day across parts of western Scotland, northwest England, Northern Ireland as well. But elsewhere, it should brighten up and it'll feel fairly warm once again in that sunshine. We could see temperatures as high as 21 degrees on Friday. That band of rain becomes a more weak feature, but it will sink into more northern areas of Wales, more widely across northern England, perhaps into the Midlands later on in the day and Saturday. Behind it, it turns much more unsettled, some showery outbreaks of rain. and will also turn considerably colder for those northwestern areas. But in the south, it should remain largely dry and bright for the weekend. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Patrick Christie's tonight. It's time for the very first of your front pages. Let's do it. Here's the Metro. J.K. Rowling and the Goblet of Ire. No forgiveness, she says, for the star's trans stance. She's not going to forgive Harry Potter actors who turn their back on her over her stance on the trans issue. Let's go to the eye. Starmer. 
Labour will hike UK defence spending amid threat from China and Russia. Interesting. Labour leader intends to boost military spending to 2.5% of GDP if he wins power. He reveals that in an interview with the Eye. That, I think, will be quite a popular move. The Daily Mail. Starmer. UK nuclear deterrent is safe in my hands. In a landmark article for the Mail, Sir Keir vows unshakable to commitment to Trident and to build a new generation of subs here. OK, let's go now to the Times. Fears of children's safety as WhatsApp cuts minimum age to 13, all right? Uh, consultants accused of covering up fatal flaws. Whistleblowers lost their jobs, apparently after raising concerns. A group of senior hospital consultants suppressed warnings about patient safety years before police were called to investigate 40 deaths, apparently. Let's go to The Guardian now. Labour warned over loss of urban seats in the election. Alienation over Gaza and climate policy could cost the party dozens of constituencies. It is, of course, their well, position on Gaza, potentially costing them uh, votes to independent candidates. I tell you what is fascinating here, if you just look at the composition of tomorrow's front pages, you've got the eye, all right, you know, does lean to the left. They've done a sit-down with Starmer, it appears, back in defence spending. The Daily Mail, certainly not leaning to the left, saying UK nuclear deterrent is safe in Starmer's hands, or at least that's what he's saying. The Guardian has been consistently critical, really, of Starmer now for a period of months. It's quite a fascinating way to look at all of that. I'm just going to go to my, my panel now. Of course, I've got the wonderful Nana Queer, I've also got Amal Bagal and Matthew Laza. Uh, Matthew, I will start with you on this, actually. Starmer's saying the UK nuclear deterrent is safe in his hands and he's going to hike UK defence spending up to the 2.5%. I mean, that really... I mean, we, Rishi Sunak's lost... Uh, at least one defence secretary and an armed forces minister for, well, amongst other reasons, but uh, not doing this. Absolutely, and I think uh, it's a sign of uh, Labour's confidence. It's effectively, forgive the uh, military metaphor, uh, got his tanks uh, on the Tories' lawn on defence. Traditionally, defence has been an area where the public, I mean, I think, uh, you know, uh, wrongly, because Labour's actually got a good record on defence, hmm. but have, have, have had concerns, and particularly in the 80s, when I was growing up, people were worried about Labour's defence stance. But now, Labour is out there on the front yeah. foot, and it shows it's working. In a I recent poll... Labour's more trust in the Tories on defence. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, Aman, I'll come to you on this. Starmer says defence is the number one issue for his government. That's quite bold, isn't it? Do you believe I mean, that? No, I mean, look, again, as I said earlier, I mean, this is um, a very fringe element uh, Labour Party, which is trying to mainstream itself to align itself with the issues that actually matter to the British public. And defence, yes, is one of them, is a big issue for, for mm. the country. And uh, But... As far as being the nuclear deterrent being safe in his hands while he's still got the rabid left in his party. I mean, let's be honest, what's stopping the hard left, the hard, hard left of the Labour Party taking over from a possible Prime Minister Starmer in two years' time into his government? Nothing. Mm. It's entirely possible. And they would scrap... Total nonsense. <laughs> I mean, come on. Come I on. mean, the Tories, have, the Tories have left it wide open for a Labour leader. Again, it's bad Absolutely. politics. But bad how, politics. How, how will he fund it? That's the, that's the question, how, well, he's not telling us how he would fund more money mm. into defence. We already spent one of the biggest defence budgets in the world. Maybe you'll take. Well, you're having defence ministers out, resigning. Maybe you'll take it out of the non-dom tax status. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, that again, and a lot of things. Again, yeah. again. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, do you trust Labour with the nuclear bus and Nana? Yeah, that would be silly. I don't. I, and I think the comments made, they, they could you turn as well. Uh, they've done literally everything they've so far come up with. The green, 28 billion on the green stuff, they've you turned. We're streeting, you turning on his stance on women. Suddenly now biological women and trans women are not the same mm. thing. Starmer did the same thing. Now they're saying that they're going to spend 2.5%. I don't even think that's enough. I'd be looking at least three anyway. And I think these are things that we expect our governments to do anyway. But, but yes, so well, we, do, we, do, we, we do expect them to do it anyway, absolutely. But mm. the fact is, they haven't. Uh, absolutely. And, 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 you know, it is, it is, again, I'll just say this again, it's terrible politics mm. that a Conservative government would allow a leader of the Labour Party to, as Matthew did rightly say, park his well, tanks look, on their lawn. Yeah, we, yeah. We've had this before, Patrick. I mean, we had Ed Miliband back in the day who claimed, mm. am I tough enough? Hell yeah. I mean, I'd stand up to... Yeah, but on, on defence, <laughs> you know, uh, NATO, is, NATO is one of the great... <laughs> achievements of the post-war Labour government alongside the NHS. All right, look, 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 let me whiz it on to the Guardian. I'm, go, I'm, go, I'm going on to the Guardian now, their front page, because Labour warned over loss of urban seats in election. Now, this
this is a this is a fascinating story. So Labour risks losing in a number of its target seats as previously loyal progressive voters turn away from the party. Senior party figures and polling experts have warned. Experts say Keir Starmer's party could struggle to win as many as a dozen of its main targets mm. and could even lose two of the seats it currently holds as a result of alienating some Muslims and younger progressive voters angered by its stance on Gaza and the climate crisis. Um, I suppose, Aman, this is hope for the Conservatives, is it? Well, I mean, look at this way. The Labour Party, for the last few years, has been pretending to be everything to everyone and then suddenly finding itself as standing for nothing. And that's exactly why you've got the likes of George Galloway now chomping at the bits, targeting Labour in big traditionally Labour uh, mm. seats, but that's what happens when you don't actually stand for anything, but you pretend to be everything to everyone. Go on, go on Matthew. I mean, this is pretty damning. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I've, I've read the piece, and it, it's, uh, it's, a slightly, uh, it's a slightly odd piece that conflates various different factors. There is one seat, uh, which is Bristol, with a new seat at Bristol Central, where the Greens are targeting Labour. It's a very diverse seat, and it's absolutely full of kind of student and Liberal voters, uh, where those issues might make a difference there. And then, obviously, we've seen the issue about the Muslim vote, but Keir will keep doing the Right thing, and if it that's means that one or two, debonair, though, isn't it? It is, that's, yeah, that's absolutely, and that is a danger. Culture. Yeah, but it's not in a dozen exactly. seats; it's in one seat. And then there's an issue about whether Labour will be able to take the seat that Caroline Lucas is vacating for the Greens in Brighton. Okay. Um, now, Nanak, I'm going to play a clip now, and I'm going to get you to react off the back of it. So, if you're not one of the shameful mob out marching for them in London every single Saturday, you have probably realised that Hamas are ruthless, murderous lunatics. Mm -hmm. Okay. But in case you needed confirmation, here is the chilling moment that their chief, Ishmael Hania, reacts to the news that three of his sons and three grandchildren, I believe, as well, have been killed by an IDF airstrike. So just watch this and just see what you make of it, OK? <laughs> OK, so he was just told in that clip that you saw there that three of his kids, who were adults, right, and, and some grandchildren, had just been killed. And he just didn't bat an eyelid, said, you know, hopefully they're with God now, and cracked on with what looked like a hospital mm. visit. I mean, Nana, that bloke is clearly a lunatic psychopath, isn't he? And when people are out there going, what about the deaths of all the Palestinian mm. babies? That guy who's leading them had just found out about the deaths of his own kids and grandkids, and he didn't care. Well, you know, this is what he apparently told the broadcasters at Al Jazeera. He said, I am grateful to God for the honour he has given me in the deaths of three of my children and a few of my grandchildren. So if, if that's the mindset there, I think he obviously had to look strong in the face of this. Yeah. But we did hear reports of some of the Hamas uh, murderers who went into Israel at the beginning on October the 7th. We heard of some of them contacting their, their families or when their families heard that they were dead. We saw some clips, and I, I can't verify they're all true, but uh, the mothers were celebrating the fact that their, her kid, their kids were dead, but they had yeah. actually died, perished on the October 7th, yeah, he's, trying he's to kill people. He praised his sons for not running from Gaza... Yeah as he hid, by the way, from Israeli forces in Qatar, which is yeah. the greatest irony of all. I, just think, I do just think, when people are out on the streets and they are talking about this devastating loss of life, you know, there's a guy there who sparked all of this on October the 7th who has just found out that news, probably the most horrific news that any parent, I would imagine, could possibly find out, who doesn't seem to bat an eyelid and is grateful for their deaths. And, you know, are you really going out and marching for people in that particular area? Oh, no, look, coming up, I'll show you how Donald Trump proved that he is the people's president, and I will bring you more of tomorrow's newspaper front pages hot off the press. This is Patrick Christie tonight on GB News. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. Cheryl Baker, good morning, Cheryl. Good morning. When you think back to 1981, um, I mean, obviously, the, 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 the ABBA <laughs> victory then wasn't all that long ago, nine years earlier. Do, do you think they had a huge influence then on the sort of direction that, that Eurovision was taking? Yeah, they did. They changed it completely. Because up to then, it had all been very staid and a bit posh, long frock, sticky bow ties, you know. And then they came along and they blew it out of the water. They looked so different. 
and they modernised it. And I think, yeah, it, it, it made a big change, made a big change after that. Mm. And we were watching your performance on Eurovision a little bit earlier on of Making Your Mind Up. I mean, you had so much fun, didn't you, up on that stage? Were you, in some part, inspired by ABBA? Um, yes, I would say so. It was ABBA was 74. I turned professional in 75 and um, did my first song for Europe, which was, you know, the when they choose the British song to go forward. Um, I did my first one in February 1976. So, yeah. It was only months after ABBA's performance that I um, I started my own Eurovision journey. Um, yeah, they they just changed the face of it. They changed the face of Eurovision. And if you look at what Eurovision is now, I think that all started with ABBA's performance. It made people think this is much more than just a song contest. It's all about the look. I mean, the clothes, because they looked fantastic. And even the composer, or not the composer, what's he called, the conductor, he was dressed as Napoleon. It was, it made it fun. Fantastic song, obviously, brilliant singing, but the whole look of it just changed the way that Eurovision is, and, and to this day. Welcome back. It's time for more of tomorrow's front pages. Now let's do it. Daily Express here for you. Daily Express bring to an end the triple lock pension injustice for millions. Campaigners call for a review as eight million pensioners miss out on full payments. So this is millions of pensioners being shortchanged by dishonest state pension payouts. Apparently, let's go to the Sun. Good riddance, grief. Long-time double murder accuser Caitlyn Jenner says good riddance uh, to, of course, O.J. Simpson, who has died today at the age of 76 after a battle with cancer. We go to... Uh, they also have a story, by the way, sorry, on the front of the sun there. You see it in the top-round corner. Harry Kane's three kids in car crash. Three of England star Harry Kane's children were reportedly rushed uh, to hospital after a horror car crash. The Daily Telegraph... Border force to blame for fake stamps earlier today. It was the Chinese. Now it's border force. Anyway, Royal Mail accuses the government of not doing enough to stop counterfeits entering the UK. Uh, Netanyahu warns Iran we will harm anyone who attacks Israel. Uh, and the Telegraph, slightly late, uncharacteristically for them, I must say, Navy to hire recruits who can't swim. We covered that earlier. And the picture, that famous picture of OJ Simpson uh, with the gloves that didn't fit. Let's go to the mirror. Infamous OJ, dead at 76. Cancer claims, quotes, killer, as ex-pal Caitlyn Jenner says good riddance. Those are all of your front pages. I am joined, of course, yet again by my panel, GB News presenter Nana Queer, founding chairman of Global Britain UK, Amon Bagal, and former Labour Party advisor Matthew Larson. Now, try as he might, Keir Starmer just can't avoid questions about his under-fire deputy leader, Angela Rayner. It's a touchy interview earlier today. Starmer refused to 100% back her. Are you 100% confident Angela Rayner's done nothing wrong here? I'm very confident. 100% confident? I'm very confident, Angela Rayner. That's different to 100% confident. Well, look, don't try and play a game on this. I've been absolutely clear. Angela's answered all those questions. I have full confidence in her. I've expressed that over and over again. But I really think that you should be asking questions about the state of the NHS. Nana, he won't actually look at the evidence himself. He's not 100% confident, and he thinks we should be asking questions about other stuff. Kiss of death for Rayner, no? Well, yeah, and, I mean, didn't he do that? He started off being really good friends with Jeremy Corbyn, and the next time it was, no, no, not really friends with him at all. This feels like the same thing. The other week, on the weekend, he was saying that he's totally confident about her and everything. Feels like now he's wavering and sort of backtracking. I think he's going to throw her under the bus. That's what I think. Not um, literally. What, what do you think about this? I mean, this is this is uh, <laughs> a, a good news for the Conservative Party, isn't it? Well, I mean, it's uh, good news for the for the country. Let's be honest. The Labour Party has spent the last three days saying, "Oh well, you know what? You shouldn't be holding uh, Angela Rayner to the same standards as she's mm. been demanding of people in government for the last two years." I mean, it's, you couldn't make it up. It's absolute buckwass. My oh, God. Oh, yeah, I nonsense. love it. That's <laughs> our favourite word. <laughs> this new thing, good stuff. And just remind us what that means. Absolute nonsense. Absolute nonsense, right, OK. It is a great word. Uh, it, is, it is, fantastic. Um, Matthew, oh, yeah, I'll just... Uh, I've got to throw the same question at you, look. He's not looking at the evidence, OK, he's refusing to. Mm -hmm. 
It's willful blindness, some would say. He's not going to say uh, he's 100% confident and he's doing the old classic of, well, why aren't you asking about this? Well, that's because I'm choosing to ask you to care about uh, Angela. Look, I've, I've said next to Labour leaders while he's been interviewed like that, and it's not a great look. I thought he was getting a bit tetchy there, as you say. Yeah. Um, uh, the reason he's not looked at the evidence is because uh, other people, uh, independent authorities, Greater Sue Manchester Grant. Police... Mr. No, Forensic. No. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Forensic. Greater Manchester Police and Stockport Council uh, are both looking at the evidence, and, uh, and we'll see what happens. I, I think Angela Rayner should be held to the same standards as everybody else. She is absolutely confident uh, that the, the, the advice she's got means that she's going to be exonerated. Let's wait and see is what the investigation says. In the meantime, not, no, because the other people are looking into it, because the independent authorities say, are looking into he, it. Well, why doesn't he just say, I 100% back Angela Ray? Because sometimes as a politician, you get annoyed with journalists trying to put words into no. your mouth, and that's what's happening there. Well, right. he was 99 right. I mean, I've done both sides of the thing, so you well, know what well, it's like. There you go. All right, now, look, Rayner has repeatedly refused to publish tax advice amid this frenzy of accusations that she lied about the sale of a formal council house in 2015 to avoid paying capital gains tax. There is, of course, an electoral roll issue as well, which more people, I think, uh, mm. appear to be ignoring, which actually could be the thing, if it's true, that would bring her down. Now, he's hard at work on the campaign trail ahead of the US election in November, but Donald Trump made time for an impromptu stop at the American fast food restaurant Chick-fil-A in Atlanta yesterday, as the former US president was feeling particularly generous. I have 30 milkshakes and also some chicken. I'm going to take care of the customers. Is this good? Making a lot of money? You're getting rich, right? Thanks very much. But will his milkshakes bring all the voters to the yard, Nana? Oh, uh, yeah, very good. Very Kelly's. No, listen, I, I think that he will. I think the only trouble he has, and I don't think that they really plan to keep Joe Biden Democrats, I think they're going to get rid of Joe Biden at the last minute. Then I think they're going to try and put in Michelle Obama. Oh. And I think Michelle Obama could cause Trump a little bit of a problem because everyone, as soon as you say Obama, a lot of the Republicans who aren't as sort of fixed on Trump may well follow. So I'm not sure whether what his you, milkshake what do you is reckon? all well, I mean, Look, he's the people's president. He always has been. Um, it's very simple, really. People have seen what Joe Biden has done to the US and are knocking on the rest of the world for the last four years. I think people got fluked in into voting for Biden in... Uh, the last election, and they will see sense again. Mm. He's flying in illegal immigrants who turn into voters, for goodness sake. Mm. People see that on the streets. He's, not He's campaigning to get the support that Ukraine He's needs, which is being, the... being held up by Donald Trump. I, 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 look, if, here in Britain, we should be very, very afraid about a second Trump presidency. Why? Sorry, Joe Biden he loves, hates us. He loves Joe Trump Biden. Loves really he really doesn't like Look, 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 look on, on a cultural level, he's a bit of a professional no, Irishman, but, but on the key things that we want... Look, even Boris, even Boris, even Boris, Boris, what, you know, Boris, David Cameron have all been over there begging uh, the Republicans to uh, we, to yeah, uh, to do what they need to do on Ukraine. Listen, Joe Biden isn't even with it. Listen, he's not even there. I think you're right he's about the candidate. I, I think it would be great if he's replaced. So, he's, done his, he's done his job. The, oh, oh, the, the, world, the world needs Donald we Trump need back. Trump. Uh, Go, Michelle. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, I mean, the Michelle Obama thing is... Uh, well, that's... Huge if true. Um, OK, now, uh, it's time for to reveal today's greatest Britain union oh. jackass. Nana, your greatest Britain. My greatest Britain has got to be the black cabbies, especially around London. Boom. Shout out to the black cabbie who picked me up today after my car had been impounded by an evil council <laughs> in London. Who Probably a Labour council. <laughs> Labour council. Can't say. You should remain, the the council should be re remain, remain unnamed. Uh, but they took my car and it's annoying because it's only like a little C1 and actually the money I had to pay to get it was more than the car's worth. <laughs> really? Yeah, Gosh, oh much, well. OK, much. black cabbies, we love them. We right, go on, ma'am. Uh, it's got to be J.K. Rowling. As Boris said, she speaks for the nation, she speaks sense. Mm. And you know what? Oh, we need more of that. So, yes, she's my... J.K. Rowling, I mean, saying as well, um, she's not going to forgive the Harry Potter yes. actors. Exactly. From what I've read, for anyway. Their, for their vogue bequests. Yeah, for, the, for, the, <laughs> for, that, for that, exactly <laughs> that. Um, go on there, Matthew. Who's your greatest person, please? Mine's Labour's Shadow Transport Secretary, Lou Hay, who's come up with a concrete plan to sort out Britain's bus routes. Key links across the country for communities uh, have been cut by the Tories. Um, and, and the media often ignores buses because, frankly, they don't get on them mm. outside London. And it's good to see Labour coming out with a plan uh, for, the, uh, 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 for buses you across know, the, 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 the The plight of the rural 
boss community is actually genuinely a thing because a lot of elderly people you know, tend to live yeah. um, uh, in rural communities as well. They need to get around. It's a lifeline. So, yeah, no, fair play. But today's Greatest Britain are the Black Cabbies. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, no. I thought you were going to win with JK. Well, the, problem, no, the only problem with JK no. Rowling is that we've actually... Um, she's, yeah. been, she's been Greatest Britain about five times <laughs> in the last ten days. So, there we go. Right, um, who is your union jackass, Nana? Um, OK, so my new union jackass is uh, Michelle Donnellan for using £34,000 of taxpayers' money to cover her libel costs after she accused an academic mm. uh, for supporting or sympathising with Hamas. So she right. ended up having to pay up for that. OK, go on, man. But we paid for it. It's got to be David Smith, uh, the then chief executive, who sent an email celebrating the conviction of Seema Mishra, her sub-postmaster, wrongfully jailed in this dreadful Horizon scandal. So this guy, this guy um, celebrated the conviction of someone who I think w is now what class is being wrongfully convicted. Exactly. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's corporate corporate corruption. And she was pregnant at the time, wasn't ex she? Ex yeah. Exactly. It's, it's, a, it's an abomination. Yeah, horrible, horrible. That. Um, go on, Matthew. Who's your... And mine's Rishi Sunak for trying to boast about the small monthly falling waiting lists when the total number of people waiting for treatment has gone up since he made his pledge. Yeah, there is quite an interesting case. I, I mean, I covered it earlier on. I think that I'm saying from memory that 30 31,600 people have now been taken off this wait. 36,100, I was close to that, um, have been taken off this waitlist. But then if you look at the amount of people that they're now not counting, because they're in communities, mm -hmm. it, it equates to exactly that. And since he was, since he made the pledge and since he became Prime Minister, the numbers have gone up. Of people yeah, waiting. I mean, the doctor strikes, so there's the other side of it, isn't it? But like, they could have know, sorted it. Well, we're paying thirty-five percent more. Anyway, we haven't got time to get into all of that. Uh, today's, today's union jackass is David Smith. Hey! There it is. Hey! Uh, again, nothing for Lazar again. Nothing for Lazar. <laughs> what a surprise! But, but it keeps you coming back, Matthew. Oh. One week you'll win. Look, can I just say a massive thank you to my wonderful panel? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you to everybody who's been watching and listening at home. Can I just urge you, if you're watching on Catch Up or if you are going to go on YouTube and see it, especially have a look at the tops of the hours. I think big questions to be asked now over Labour's handling over the whole trans issue that has come to a head yesterday with that cash report. Would you trust Labour to look after children in this country? Also, the foreign aid issue as well. Now, actually, remarkably, being spent very, very much in Britain. £4 billion of it, a little bit more than that, being spent here in Britain. Headliners are up next. They've got a heck of a lot to go out here in tomorrow's newspaper front page. They'll be doing it in their own inimitable style. It's a great lineup on headliners. I will be back tomorrow at 9 pm, and I've got a little surprise in store for you <laughs> as well. So make sure that you stay tuned for all of that. See you tomorrow at 9. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Good evening. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. Well, it will be a cloudy start tomorrow, but it should brighten up later on in the day. But for the far northwest, we're likely to see fairly persistent rain. High pressure is starting to spread its influence into southern areas of the UK, but further north and west, we'll see weather fronts push in through the next few days. And this evening, much of the rain will be restricted to the far north and west of Scotland. Also, parts of northwest England, Cumbria, will likely see some heavy bursts of rain throughout this evening. Elsewhere throughout the night, it should stay largely dry away from the coasts and over the hills, but it's going to be a very cloudy and mild night. Temperatures again, double digits by, for a minimum. Across the far northeast of Scotland, it should be a fairly dry and bright start, perhaps some areas in the Midlands as well. But by and large, it's going to be a fairly cloudy start to the day. It'll likely stay quite cloudy and wet for much of the day across parts of western Scotland, northwest England, Northern Ireland as well. But elsewhere, it should brighten up and it'll feel fairly warm once again in that sunshine. We could see temperatures as high as 21 degrees on Friday. That band of rain becomes a more weak feature, but it will sink into more northern areas of Wales, more widely across northern England, perhaps into the Midlands later on in the day and Saturday. Behind it, it turns much more unsettled, some showery outbreaks of rain, and it'll also turn considerably colder for those northwestern areas. But in the south, it should remain largely dry and bright for the weekend. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. This is your chance to win our biggest prize of the year so far. First, there's a totally tax-free £10,000 in cash for you to spend this summer. Then we want to send you on a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. Thanks to Variety Cruises, you'll be able to choose from any of their 2025 green